My name is Dr. Janet Velasquez and welcome to the Prioritization and Delegation Series. First thing I want to talk to you about today is prioritization. And what is it? It is as simple as deciding which problem requires immediate attention right now and which problem, which task can be postponed or delayed or put to a later time. Rosalinda Alfaro in 2017 suggests that there's three levels of priority setting. The very first one includes the acronym ABC plus V and L. And what does that stand for? So airway, breathing, cardiac status and circulation. And then the V and the L are vital signs and lab values that could be life threatening. The second level will include any mental status changes, untreated medical issues, acute pain, acute elimination problems, and any impending risks. And the third level is going to use long-term issues, rest, and coping. Now, I ask that in addition to this, you also consider Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Please remember, with Maslow's, we always have to prioritize from the most crucial all the way to actualization. I want you to think down here, safety and security. And up here, I want you to think about the client becoming self-actualized. So let's put this into perspective of a potential client. So let's say I have two clients. One has a respiratory rate of three and my second client feels lonely. Well, who should I go see first? Of course, both clients are important, but who do I need to see first? Definitely it's that client with that respiratory rate of three, right? Those vital signs are completely abnormal and I have an impending risk here. And what's the risk? Pretty soon this client's gonna stop breathing. All right, so let's move on to delegation and supervision. When we delegate, we must do it based on the unique situation that's in front of us, our clients and our patients, and the personnel that I'm going to be delegating to, who I will always refer to as the delegatee. So what factors should we be considering when we delegate a task? Well, I need to think, is this a routine treatment? Or is this the first time my client's having this procedure done? What could go wrong and have a negative effect on my client? Does the State Practice Act allow my delegatee to perform this task? Is it within their scope of practice? Does the delegatee have the education and the skill set to complete the task? All of these questions need to be running around your head when you decide that you are going to be delegating a task. All right, so with this in mind, let's talk about the five rights of delegation. You have right person, right task, right circumstance, right communication and instruction, and right supervision and evaluation. So the very first one we're gonna talk about is right person. And the first step here is to establish the competency of your delegatee. Remember, the task must be within their scope of practice. And the delegatee must always perform at the level of the standard of care. Now, let me give you two examples of real life scenarios where we could apply this. So in scenario number one, I have Leslie. Leslie is an LPN, and an LPN is a licensed practical nurse. And I'm going to ask or delegate to Leslie to administer a medication to a client through a nasogastric tube, an NG tube. In scenario number two, I have Susie, who is a UAP. And a UAP is an unlicensed assistive personnel. And I'm gonna ask Susie to administer an oral medication to a client who has just successively passed their cookie swallow test. So let's think about these two scenarios. Which one is right? 
which one is wrong? Yes, absolutely. Scenario number two is wrong. I could never delegate a UAP to administer any sort of medication for me. Now, I do want to do a side note here. There are circumstances and scenarios when you get to practice where there will be UAPs who hold special certificates and they're able to administer medications. However, as part of this series, the UAP will never be allowed to administer any medications, any routes, oral, etc. All right, so the next right is right task. As a registered nurse, you must identify which task is appropriate to delegate and which are not. Tasks you want to choose to delegate are those that are repetitive and require little to no direction and supervision. So let me give you two life scenarios where we can apply this. So I have Anna, who is a PCT, and a PCT is a patient care technician. And I will delegate to her to assist a client who has MRSA in a sacral wound to use a bedside commode. And in my second scenario, I have Roxanne, who is also a PCT, and I will delegate to her to perform wound care and addressing change to the very same client with the sacral wound. So let's think about these two scenarios. Which one is right and which one is wrong? Yes, you guessed it. The second scenario is incorrect. This is the wrong task to delegate. This is a task that I either need to perform myself or that it would be more appropriate to delegate to an LPN. Moving on to our third right, which is right circumstance. And it is essential to match your client's acuity with your delegacy. You have to think about the outcome for your patient and the workload that you're assigning to the delegacy. So let me give you two scenarios. In scenario A, I have Brandon, who is an AP, an assistive personnel. And I am going to delegate to Brandon to measure vital signs of a client who is status post a lab coli. What does this mean? It means they're post-operative after a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which is a fairly common, uncomplicated procedure. This client is stable. In my second scenario, I have Amanda, who is also an AP. And I'm going to delegate to Amanda to measure the vital signs of a client who is also post-op, a lab coli. However, this client during their PACU stay required naloxone administration to reverse a respiratory depression. Now, let's think about both of these scenarios. Which one is right and which one is wrong? You guessed it. The second scenario is wrong. This client requires ongoing monitoring and evaluation from the RN. This client could potentially have respiratory depression again. This client could potentially require administration of Narcan or Naloxone again. This is an ongoing assessment that should be done by the RN. This is not a task that we should delegate to anyone else. This client is not stable. Our fourth delegation right is right communication and right instruction. As registered nurses, we need to communicate all data that should be collected by our delegate team. We must communicate who and when to report the data. We need to give a timeline of when the data is to be performed. So let me give you two scenarios where we can apply this. In scenario number one, I'm going to delegate a task to Linda. Linda is a CNA. What is a CNA? It's a certified nursing assistant. Good morning, Linda. I need a daily weight on Mr. Hernandez in room 256 because he has CHF. And I need you to report it to me. Okay? All right, thank you, Linda. 
In scenario number two, I'm going to delegate a task to Susanna, who is also a CNA. Good morning, Susanna. Mr. Hernandez in room 256 requires daily weight because he has CHF, as you know. The weight needs to be taken in the AM between 7 o'clock and 7.30. If the client has a weight increase or decrease of more than two pounds, I need you to report it to me immediately. If the weight remains the same as the day before or it differs by less than two pounds, then please make sure you report the change of weight before 10 o'clock in the morning. Do you have any questions for me? So let's analyze both of these situations. Which one do you think is right and which one do you think is wrong? Absolutely, scenario number one is wrong. There's not enough communication and instruction that was given to the CNA. And the fifth and final right of delegation is right supervision and right evaluation. Here, we must monitor the performance of the delegatee. We should intervene if it is necessary. And we have to remember that we have to uphold the standard of care. In addition to this, I want you to provide feedback once the task is completed and I want you to evaluate the client's outcome. Remember, evaluation is part of the nursing process and there's no circumstance where we can delegate any part of the nursing process. So let me give you two scenarios where we can apply this concept. So I have Leanne, Leanne is a UAP and I'm going to delegate to her to perform peri care on a client who has a Glasgow Comma Scale of 2, a GCS. When I walk into the room, I see Leanne wiping from back to front. I immediately stop Leanne and I explain to her and I show her how to perform this procedure correctly. During this procedure, we must always wipe from front to back, Leanne because if we wipe from back to front, then we are cleaning from an area that is more contaminated to an area that's less contaminated, which means that ultimately we're spreading bacteria. Before leaving the room, I will ask Leanne to return demonstration to me, and I will ask her if she has any questions. In the second scenario, I'm going to delegate the insertion of a urinary catheter to an LVN. And what is an LVN? It's a licensed vocational nurse. As I walk into the room, I see the LVN wearing clean gloves as she is getting ready to insert that urinary catheter. And I think to myself, not my license, not my problem. And I walk out of the room. So let's think about both of these scenarios. Which one do you think is right? And which one do you think is wrong? Absolutely. Scenario number two is wrong. Please don't fall into the trap of thinking that it's not your license and it's not your problem. Remember, the UAP and the LPN work under your license. It is your problem. Beyond that, you know the LVN is harming the client. And our number one goal is always client safety. As part of this series, I wanted to include the three team members that we will most commonly be delegating to. You have the unlicensed assistive personnel, the licensed practical or vocational nurse, and the registered nurse. When you delegate to the UAP, I want you to delegate clients who are stable and who are in uncomplicated circumstances. I want you to delegate procedures or tasks that are routine, that are simple, they are repetitive. Activities that do not require nursing judgment. Some examples will include activities of daily living, ADLs, feeding, hygiene, ambulation, to name a few. When you think about delegating to the LPN or the LVN, I want you to consider that that person can do everything that the UAP can do and in addition, they can perform ongoing monitoring as part of the RN assessment. They can administer medications with the exception of the IV push. 
They can perform sterile procedures such as tracheostomy care and suctioning or inserting a urinary catheter. They can also perform enteral feedings. Please remember, if you have to choose between delegating to the UAP or the LPN, always consider the five delegation rights. Now, the last team member that you may delegate to is a fellow RN, and you will most probably be using this when you wear that charge nurse hat. All right, everyone, this concludes our priority and delegation video series. I hope that you have found this to be instrumental and to serve as an excellent foundation upon where you can build some great delegation skills. Until next time.